Okay, if I could have your attention, if I uh, can have quiet in the, in the back there. Um, my name is Carl Kenritz, I'm Senior Vice Provost, and it's really my pleasure here to introduce uh, today's speaker. Before, but before I get uh, there, I want, do want to also thank um, those of us, um, those in the room who helped sponsor this event, the Office of the Provost, the University Library, Spartan Bookstore, and the new Division of Research and Innovation. So thanks to those of you who uh, helped make this possible. And uh, today, we're really I'm very pleased to bring Wendy Rouse uh, to the podium. And she's going uh, to tell us about her own hero, the origins of women's self-defense movement, 1890 to 1920. So please welcome Wendy. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to get to share some of my research with you. Have any of you taken a self-defense class before? OK, OK, so you'll, have, you'll recognize some of the techniques and some of the images that I'm going to show you. And some of this will be very familiar to you. And if you haven't, that's OK. I'm going to tell you everything you wanted to know and didn't want to know about the history of women's self-defense, more than you need to know. Um, I want to start, though, with a story to kind of contextualize this. In 1905, there was a woman named Nellie Griffith. And she was a telephone operator in Oakland, California. And she was walking home from work. And it was night. It was after dark. And she felt like someone was following her. So she kept kind of looking over her shoulder. And finally, she realized that someone was following her. It was very scary. So she sped up to see if she could kind of out, outrun the person. And, and she looked behind her, and he was still following her. And eventually, he starts making really inappropriate remarks. And this scares her. So she tries to get home as fast as she can. Now, he catches up to her, and he grabs her by the arm. She turns around. She says, let go, but he doesn't. So she gets the courage to put her hand into a fist, and she punches him square in the nose. And he starts bleeding. He starts screaming for help. A crowd gathers around. Eventually, the police show up, and they arrest him, and they haul him off to jail for assault. Now, one incredulous reporter arrives on the scene, and he has never seen anything like this. He has never seen a woman fight back in this way. And so he interviews her, and he says, you know, how could, you, how could a woman like you, a little lady like you, do this to a man like this? And she said, if you could be forced to stand the everlasting insults that a woman is, you could understand why I acted as I did tonight. I've waited too long for some bystander to take up the fight for me, but no one has ever volunteered. So I was compelled to assert my rights. This is a really interesting statement. Think about it. It's 1905. Griffith is clearly articulating here not only her right, but her ability to defend herself. And this is really the emergence of what I call like the hashtag Me Too moment of the early 20th century. Uh, women's self-defense emerged during this time when women are fighting for political, economic, and social equality. But they're fighting for much more than just their right to vote or their right to pursue a job of their choice, their right to pursue an education. They're fighting for something as simple as the right to walk down the street free from harassment and assault. A lot of people ask me, um, you know, what made you want to write about this topic? It seems so, so uh, kind of obscure. And I'm a historian, and I've never really thought about writing about this topic. But I've also studied martial arts for my whole life, and I've never really thought about writing about this topic. Um, when I was training in martial arts as a young woman, we were told that our teachers were the first generation of women to ever study self-defense, to ever study martial arts. So this would be the women of the 60s and the 70s. So I really didn't think it had much history beyond my teacher's generation. And even when I started studying history, I never heard anything about Nellie Griffith or any of these people from this time period um, that were studying self-defense. But what struck me is when I was doing research for my dissertation, I came across this image uh, in a newspaper article. And I was surprised, because this woman is doing a Palm Hill strike, a classic Palm Hill strike that's taught in almost every self-defense class uh, you'll ever take. In fact, many of you probably learned this in the self-defense class that you took. And I was surprised because this goes farther back than I ever knew. This is like 1905. And these women are training in classic self-defense. So I clipped this article, 
And I went back through the newspapers and I started trying to find any evidence I could of what's going on here to try to understand it, to try to contextualize it. And what I learned through my research is that although women's self-defense classes are often seen as a relatively new phenomenon, and they're often in the media depicted as kind of a fad, they have a much longer history. And this history has really paralleled the various waves of the women's rights movements. But this history, like most of women's history, has been obscured. Just as women have been taught to be quiet, to take up less space, so their history has often been silenced as well. Women's rights groups have been loudly calling attention to the issue of harassment and sexual assault for over a century. They have demanded laws to protect women. They have demanded the enforcement of these laws. They have insisted that men change their behavior, and they have fought cultures of toxic masculinity. And in the reverberating silence that has often echoed back at them, they have determined that sometimes they have no other choice but to fight back. OK, I want to give you some context first before we dive into the reasons why women um, started training in self-defense, although I think it's kind of obvious now. Um, first of all, you need to know that at the turn of the century, athletics in general were becoming more common and popular among middle class and upper class Americans. In fact, um, boxing became quite the fad at the time. Um, there were a number of factors that arise for, that account for the rise in uh, athletics. One of them is that Americans had more leisure time, or middle class Americans had more leisure time. Um, and there was growing concern about the health of Americans who were working increasingly in office jobs and factories. And so there was concern about improving the nation's health. There was also concern, an imperialistic concern, about maintaining the US supremacy on the world stage. And part of this included a concern with the health and virility of Americans. So the manly art of boxing was touted as one way to improve and develop the superior character of men and their physical strength as well. So we see a new form of boxing emerging. Now, boxing had already been quite popular, especially to go and watch prize fights. But middle class men, for the first time, are engaging in actual boxing classes, taking lessons in boxing. But they didn't want to get too hurt, so this was mostly like light sparring, bag work, you know, that type, sort of thing. Nothing that would really be too dangerous for them. So boxing became popular among middle class men. But there's also a large group of middle class and upper class women now that are going to college. And at college, they are also becoming more involved in athletics. So boxing appealed to many young women because they saw this as having two benefits. One, improve their health, and two, learn self-defense. So what we see is more and more women um, participating in boxing and taking lessons. Sometimes this, these lessons were at their colleges. Sometimes they hired private boxing instructors to teach them. But you can imagine the backlash that they received. People were saying, this isn't right. If women start practicing boxing, it's going to masculinize them. It's going to transform their bodies. They'll start acting more like men. So there was concern about this. People were concerned about disrupting binary notions of femininity and masculinity. So boxing instructors responded by kind of remarketing it and saying that boxing would essentially turn women into more womanly women. It would actually enhance their feminine beauty, right? So you see articles like this. <laughs> so you can actually maintain your summer body. And you can, you know, the ideal woman would train in boxing. They also, there's a lot of gendered ads that also said that it could, you know, appeal to men. You, do you want to improve her bad temper, her feminine hysterics, her catty disposition? <laughs> Just encourage her to take boxing. So it wasn't unusual at this time to see young women um, and children studying boxing. Okay, jujitsu. Jujitsu also became a popular kind of trend at this time. American anxiety about Japanese military might 
and a fascination with all things Japanese culture in the early 20th century helped to give rise to this fascination with Japanese martial arts. Japan had just defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, and American President Theodore Roosevelt was really interested in this, and he started to take notice of Japan as an emerging world power. He was anxious to learn more about Japanese jiu-jitsu. He, he was a fan of Japanese history and culture. He had read a lot on the samurai and samurai culture. And when he heard that a famous jiu-jitsu instructor was visiting the United States, he invited him to the White House to teach him what he had learned. And he loved it. He loved it so much um, that they practiced. This is Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and he was really into sports. He, he had done boxing, by the way, in college. He loved it so much that he invited these jiu-jitsu instructors to the White House, and they put down, they put down mattresses on the White House uh, floor, and they started, he started practicing the throws and the techniques with them. Um, he loved it so much that he thought, really, that all American men should study this. But obviously, there was racist attitudes about Japanese jiu-jitsu and Japanese immigrants. And critics initially condemned it. They said, no, it's too feminine. It's an unmanly means of fighting. It's unfair. Uh, but Roosevelt, he, he didn't entirely disagree. He believed that boxing and wrestling were the superior manly arts. Western means of fighting were superior. But he thought there was something to jiu-jitsu and that American men would benefit by studying it and learning some of the techniques of the Japanese. So he advocates that it be adopted by the American military. So we actually see um, the military starting to train in that um, during the Roosevelt era, he hired, he asked his instructor to go and teach uh, at the military academies, and they started to train in this, really what I call the first mixed martial arts, because not only were they practicing boxing and wrestling, they were also now picking up these jiu-jitsu techniques. And so that you can see videos from this time period. By World War I, it was pretty much widely adopted by militaries in the U.S. and in Europe. This is sped up. They're not that good. <laughs> and then after the, the war is over, um, and even, even somewhat before that, people start teaching this mixed martial arts in, in the United States. So if they had trained in the military and they'd learned boxing and wrestling and a little bit of jiu-jitsu, they would open up their own gyms and they would promise to teach you to protect yourself. And again, we see these very gendered types of advertisements. Um, they endorsed uh, jiu-jitsu as a means of enabling a smaller man to overcome a larger opponent. Uh, and they said, basically, that uh, you would be able to protect not only yourself, but your loved ones, protect that little woman in your life right, from any kind of harm. And so they started to advertise in this way, mostly through young men's magazines. But this also opened an opportunity for women, again, to study uh, a martial art. And so women start studying jiu-jitsu in part because Japanese women studied jiu-jitsu. So feminist-minded women here in the United States are like, well, if these Japanese women are studying it, why can't American women uh, practice it as well? And this was mostly advocated by a woman named Martha Wadsworth. She was a wealthy Washingtonian uh, heiress. Uh, she ran in the same social circles as Roosevelt and all of his, uh, his uh, friends. And she hated Roosevelt. She actually despised him. She hated the fact that when he was running for office, he would show off his physicality as a way to, to get elected. Um, so she, she v vowed that any time he would do some sort of physical feat, especially for the media, that she would duplicate it, just to show that women could do it too, and he wasn't all that he pretended to be. So when he took up jujitsu, she said, okay, all right, we got this. So she hired ju the... Um, Teddy Roosevelt's instructor's wife to teach her and her friends and their daughters jujitsu. And they actually held a class on the White House lawn and invited reporters to come and watch. <laughs> and when they were interviewed, they basically said that the manly art is now the womanly art, and women can do it too. So they were very politically uh, empowered and motivated by this. So the, actually, this is a picture of the girls that were in the class. And these were all the daughters of congressmen and high-level people in, in Washington. OK, so that's how boxing and jiu-jitsu kind of became mainstream. But the individual reasons why women signed up for these classes obviously varies quite a bit. So let's talk about uh, the street, first of all, women wanting to use self-defense on the street. So returning to Nellie Griffin, remember her in the very beginning, we talked about the telephone operator. 
who was attacked on the street. Most women signed up for these classes because they were concerned about that threat. Previously, there was this concept of separate spheres, this idea that a woman's place is in the home, that a man's place is in the public sphere, and especially middle class and upper class women were told that they should not be out on the street, that essentially any respectable woman wouldn't go out without being accompanied by a male protector. So their husband, their boyfriend, their cousin, their brother, you know, somebody to be there by their side to protect them. But obviously, times were changing. More and more women were pursuing, middle class women were pursuing education. They were shopping. There was leisure activities within the cities. And so we saw more women out on the streets, more of these uh, middle class, previously sheltered women out on the streets. And the growth of cities, the expansion of factory and office work also provided more jobs in the city. But their presence in these traditionally male spaces invited backlash. And the biggest example of this backlash we might say would be the masher. So you can see the term here, New York mashers. Now this is an old fashioned term that I think we should bring back. Um, it's really cool. Uh, it was a short way of saying someone, a man who sexually assaulted or harassed a woman on the street. We don't really have a, a phrase for that anymore, so we just say a man who sexually assaulted and harassed a woman on the street. It's way too long, just call him a masher. And then with the masher, you have the smash the masher crusade. So you got a nice little slogan, t-shirts and stuff can be made from it, so it would be good. So the masher um, was, uh, kind of became a really important um, topic of conversation because women, like I said, this was the hashtag Me Too moment of this generation, women started complaining. And they said, look, we're trying to go out to go shopping or we're trying to go to our job and um, we're getting harassed by these people on the streets. And the, the phrasing of the time is so funny. They say, they made goo-goo eyes at me or they ogled me. You know, there's all these uh, weird ways of describing it. But mashers, they, that could describe anything from verbal harassment to physical or sexual harassment as well, assault as well. So it was a broad term. But women, they started to complain about these issues. But people told them, one, go back home. That was a very common thing to say. You shouldn't be out on the street. Respectable women don't belong here. Or they said uh, that maybe you're asking for it. Maybe it's the way that you're dressed, which is hilarious if you look at the clothing from back then. They're telling them that they're dressed too provocatively. Um, but there really was this culture that blamed the victim for what was happening to them at the time. So women, they refused to be silent. They started writing in their stories to the new women journalists who were writing advice columns in the papers at the time. And they started complaining about being harassed on the street, about being harassed at work. And they started highlighting these examples. And you ended up having hot, these headlines like this one uh, in all the major newspapers at the time, just calling attention to this issue of harassment. So the police and the courts felt pressure to try to do something. They start to put special patrols out on the street to try to to solve the problem of mashing. Women are encouraged to, to report these cases, and it becomes a, a more common thing. But self-defense classes also become an issue because women find that the police aren't everywhere. They can't be everywhere, and they're not always there to help them in these cases. So self-defense classes became more popular, and essentially what you have is women forming self-defense classes um, in major cities, so New York, LA. There was a woman named Virgie Drox, and she was living in LA at the time. And she had just visited New York, and she saw all these women training in boxing and jujitsu. And so she's, she wanted to start something like this. She wanted to feel safer walking down the street. So she advocated uh, self-defense training. But if you think about it, in some ways, self-defense training is just reinforcing existing class and racial hierarchies. Women's self-defense uh, training was a form of class privilege. Only women who could afford it could take those classes. And that was mostly middle and upper class white women. So the self-defense instructors, and even the newspapers to some extent, uh, start to highlight this. And they play into white women's fears. So they focus on the danger really being immigrants and men of color. And they try to market their self-defense classes in this way. So they present this like shadowy stranger that exists out on the street that's just waiting to attack you, like in the story in the beginning. And they start to highlight those cases where strangers attack women on the street. And it's tr they try to emphasize that. And newspaper reporters, they buy into this, this fear of the other. And so they also print uh, those types of stories because they find that it sells more uh, papers. And it also elicits more public outrage. So reporters would often emphasize the whiteness 
the racial purity of the female victims of mashers. But the reality is, is that mashers um, were mostly, statistically from the research that I did, native-born white men, and their victims were women of all races. In fact, cases of harassment and assault against middle and upper class white women were more likely to be highlighted in the press, but women of color were rarely mentioned in the newspapers as victims of the mashers, even though we know that they were, statistically. Newspapers were produced by white men for a largely uh, white audience, and so they tended to downplay th these instances of violence against women of color, and women of color were probably more reluctant to report these assaults knowing that very little would be done, that white women's bodies were considered uh, more valuable than their own. So that's kind of the dark side of this women's self-defense training. This is the smash the masher thing that I was telling you about. How cool is that? So despite this, uh, many women who studied self-defense were mostly, uh, again, like I said, middle and um, upper class white women. Uh, but women who couldn't afford to take these classes taught themselves largely. There were tutorials in the paper. There were books you could buy. There were articles that taught you how to protect yourself. So these techniques, uh, a lot of women learned them. And they were really challenging this notion that uh, they couldn't protect themselves, that they were saying they could be their own protectors. But this became kind of a, a point of humor uh, in, the, in the press as well. And people started to say, well, what's going to happen if these gender roles are completely inverted and women learn to protect themselves, then what's going to happen to men? They're going to become sissies, and they're not going to be able to protect themselves, and then they're going to need women to protect them as well. Hold on, I'll show you this one. There we go. Yes, she does. Okay, so you see this, they're kind of mocking that a little bit. Okay, so in addition to signing up for self-defense classes uh, because they want to protect themselves on the street, women also signed up for self-defense classes as a, as a form of political empowerment as well. The emergence of women's self-defense emerges uh, and parallels the rise of the suffrage movement of this time period. Suffragists believed that the vote would provide them with the political power they needed to protect themselves. So every, almost everyone's heard of Susan B. Anthony, right? In 1871, she gave a speech in San Francisco, and she said in that speech, I declare to you that woman must not depend on the protection of man, but must be taught to protect herself. And there I take my stand. Now, I'd like to say she was talking about jujitsu and boxing, but she wasn't. She was talking about the vote, that if women had the vote, they could pass laws to protect themselves and their families, and they didn't need to rely on men. But suffragists, who were advocates of self-defense and boxing, took this concept and applied it to their own training and said, essentially, that if women could protect themselves physically, they could also uh, be able to uh, fight back against oppression. And in fact, this took on a really stark reality as suffragists started to face more and more intense t forms of violence from anti-suffrage protesters. And this association, um, this is a, by the way, this is an image of um, some men taking a suffrage flag away from a suffragist who was uh, protesting at the White House, and they actually grabbed the flag, pulled it away, and this is them laughing afterwards because they got the flag. So at first, these suffragists start to face these types of assaults where their, their, their flags are taken away, their banners, that they're pulled to the ground, and they're pushed or whatever. But the suffragists in England, what we call the suffragettes, they experienced a lot of uh, physical assault and harassment. 
And the association between the necessity of self-defense became more obvious for them. British suffragettes faced intense physical assaults from anti-suffragists. They had rotten fruit and urine-soaked rags thrown at them. They were literally pushed, shoved, kicked, punched by counter-protesters, and often by the police. In fact, police brutality was one of their major problems and complaints. They learned that no one was going to protect them, especially not the police, so they had to protect themselves. So this is my favorite part of this whole presentation, is they formed jujitsu for self suffragette self-defense. And they actually advertised it in their Votes for Women newspapers. So how cool is that? So now there's like reenactor groups that dress like suffragettes and study suffragette jujitsu. Um, Edith Garrett was the instructor. She was a longtime jujitsu practitioner, uh, and she had uh, was already teaching jujitsu classes when the suffragettes started to suggest that they should learn self-defense. So she organized this class just for them. They actually had very public demonstrations. They used some police officers as their examples, and they they were openly practicing until they began to be investigated more and more by the police, and then they had to go underground. They had to practice in secret. They had to hide from the police. They actually created a suffragette bodyguard to protect their leaders. And these were all women trained in self-defense and jiu-jitsu who could protect the leaders who were constantly being arrested and re-arrested uh, by the police. So they were really stretching the boundaries of what was proper feminine behavior. And they were criticized, obviously, as being too masculine, not only in their practice of self-defense, but in their advocacy of women's rights. And so you can see this criticism through political cartoons, mostly. It kind of mocks them. It mocks the police at the same time, saying, look how scared the police are. And there was postcards were, were really popular, so even the postcards would mock the suffragettes who studied self-defense. American suffragettes were inspired by this, but the militant tactics of the British suffragettes were kind of controversial. So there was a woman named Zelie Emerson. She was working in... Jane Addams' Hull House in Chicago, and she had a chance to hear the British suffragette leader Sylvia Pankhurst speak. And Pankhurst was describing what was happening in, in England at the time, in, in Britain, and she was completely, Emerson was completely just overwhelmed. She was like, I have to do something. I want to go. I want to I participate in this. So she traveled back um, with Pankhurst, much to her parents' uh, dismay, and she began to participate in the militant tactics there. She was uh, arrested at one point. She went on hunger strike. She was force fed. And when she left prison, she became even more militant than she, when she went in. So she began to advocate for the study of jujitsu, right? Just like the other uh, British suffragettes. And in fact, she helped Sylvia Pankhurst organize a people's army. So they got very militant. They all uh, started training in jujitsu. They started carrying clubs with them to fight back against the police. She had her skull fractured twice by police batons, and that's part of why she became an advocate of jujitsu self-defense. Now, women in the United States did not experience the same kind of police brutality, but they did have their own experiences with violence. There was a suffrage parade in 1913 in Washington, D.C., and the parade really ended in chaos as the crowd kind of started to push in against the paraders, against the marchers, and women describing pushed and shoved and kicked and sexually assaulted. And they made their complaints known at, to a congressional investigating committee afterwards. And their biggest complaint was that the police did very little. And in some cases, the police were actually egging on the crowd. So you can imagine what happens after this 1913 parade. We see suffragettes organizing self-defense classes here in the United States. I don't know how widespread this is. I only have a few examples of it because most of these women did it in secret. They didn't want the negative attention that was associated with the British suffragettes and the militants there. So they, would, they refused to give their names to the few reporters that did show up and say, we want to report on what you're doing. Um, but there were suffragette self-defense classes advertised in the months right after the 1913 parade, especially. We saw b boxing classes, and um, the, the whole concept was that they needed to prepare to defend themselves against these anti-suffrage protesters. Okay, a much more controversial reason why women um, signed up for self-defense classes was uh, violence in the home. All of these public discussions about harassment and violence in the home really 
we're focused on this masher conversation or about women campaigning for the vote. But women's rights activists wanted to highlight the actual truth. And the truth was that the actual sources of violence against women were more often from the men that they loved in their own homes. Now, a few prominent feminists pointed out the radical truth about violence against women. And they said that men are, are, are primarily the perpe perpetrators of violence against women in their own homes, um, and that the domestic sphere is not so protected as people claim. So this idea of the other on the, straight, on the street, this a shadowy stranger, they start to call that into question and say, is that really the real threat against women? And, and obviously their answer is no. This is best illustrated by a crime spree that happened in Chicago right around the time that Nellie Griffin was attacked here in Oakland, 1905 to 1906. So if you go through the Chicago papers, there's all these really high profile cases of women being attacked and killed. And the implication of almost all of these articles is that they're being killed by some shadowy stranger on the street, as, you know, some dangerous uh, stranger. But I was curious about this because we know that that is often not the actual source of violence against women. So I wanted to know about these 24 cases. So I looked at these 24 cases, and I went back and included the cases in the years leading up to it as well. And I looked at a five-year period. And what I found is that there were 99 women murdered during that time period in Chicago. And 85% of them were killed by men they knew. Husbands, suitors, neighbors, friends, male relatives. And 67% were killed at home or at work. And the numbers are probably higher, because there was a, at least like 10 that I couldn't identify who killed them or where they were killed. So this is appalling, but it points out what the, many of the women's rights advocates were, were saying at the time, is that the home was really the most dangerous place for women. So the reality that women are most at risk for violence from the men in their own lives further shatters this notion of the home as a protected domestic space, that men were women's natural protectors. And this inspired radical women's rights activists to write about it, to talk about it. Charlotte Perkins Gilman said there's this popular masculine myth that assumes that man is woman's natural protector, but he is, in fact, often the worst danger she can hope to meet. And so she actually started advocating, mostly through her fiction writings, that women study boxing and jiu-jitsu to defend themselves. And a lot of the characters in her book start off very weak, and by the end, after training in boxing and jiu-jitsu, they're very strong and powerful. So she argued against the stereotypes that gendered women as weaker and less capable of violence. She said there's no reason whatsoever why the female should not use violence whenever it's necessary. In fact, she said, girls of today taught a little plain skill in wrestling and boxing are far safer from their protector than they were once before. So women's self-defense represents this radically empowering idea of autonomy. But this issue of violence against women, especially violence in the home, would be a concern that would be raised by future generations of feminists, and it would definitely not be resolved or really addressed much in this uh, generation. And again, there's a lot of humor associated with this, with the criticism of if you do teach women self-defense, what are they gonna do? Especially these suffragists, they're gonna start to beat their husbands in the home, dominate their husbands. Okay, so that's kind of women's self-defense during that time period. You are probably aware then that there was this a second wave of women's self-defense that emerged in the 60s and the 70s. Here we go, this is a better picture. Shows you the 60s and 70s. Um, and they became associated with this, again, this idea of empowerment, uh, this rebirth of the self-defense movement was really tied to these uh, feminist consciousness raising uh, sessions at the time. And these new self-defense mo movements were committed not only to the physical empowerment of women, but to these discussions about the realities of violence and where violence actually stems from. So activists were focused on dispelling this narrow myth of the stranger danger, and they're looking at the multiple sources of harassment and violence that women encounter, not just on the street, but at work and in their homes. And they focused on challenging these harmful gender stereotypes and this pervasive rape culture. And we see their fight obviously continuing on from the 60s and 70s. There's a little bit more in the 90s. We see self-defense instructors talk about like a third wave of popularity of self-defense. And today there's something called empowerment self-defense, ESD. People are actually like certified in this. And most of these instructors were trained in the 60s and 70s in these feminist self-defense courses. And then they created ESD, which is um, kind of a, 
tied to that earlier movement. And their focus is on women's physical and personal empowerment, setting boundaries and de-escalation assertiveness training, but also looking at larger social issues like gender socialization, uh, rape culture, sexism, racism, classism, holding perpetrators responsible. And these ESD classes have really taken off, especially in the last three years or so. There's been a lot more demand for self-defense classes, especially um, among immigrants, women of color. And so these classes really are tied to these earlier waves of feminist self-defense courses. So the self-defense training that emerged in the early 20th century was a way for women to powerfully claim their bodies as their own. For centuries, women were told that they needed to rely on men to think for them, to vote for them, and to protect them. In this context then, when women decided to train in self-defense, they were loudly and boldly shouting, enough is enough. Through self-defense training, they were asserting their right to their humanity by empowering themselves physically and politically. I don't like to end with my own voice. I like to end with this really cool video I found from the 1920s slash 30s. It's a little bit out of my time period, but you've got to watch it. I'm going to be attacked. I hold my bag more firmly to my side. I grip his wrist, draw his arm forwards and upwards, and place my disengaged arm across his body. In this position, it's quite easy for me to dislocate his elbow. Although his other arm is free, it's quite impossible for him to strike me, as I'm nearly. As soon as I feel his arm around my neck, I lean slightly forward, grip his wrist and elbow, and by bending my knees, I lower my center of gravity, roughly speaking, my hips below his center of gravity, and by bending sharply forward. <laughs> Notice I do not attempt to break away from his grip, but by bending well back, encourage his weight onto his toes. I turn my body, place his arm under mine, and in this position, it's quite easy for me to dislocate his wrist, elbow, <laughs> I catch his ankle, place my hand between his shoulders, and kick away his only support. Now I'm going to give him a real throw. I'm gripped in the same manner as before, the tramp not having learned his lesson. This time I draw his body upwards till it's in the form of a hoop. I lie gently on the floor, placing one foot in his tummy. The answer's in the infirmary. <laughs> Don't forget to do your makeup when you can I answer any questions? Or? Thank you. My mom is 95 now and was a phys ed teacher and coach for an entire career in the middle of the 20th century. And she wrote a master's essay, the equivalent of a thesis, uh, about the development of basketball and women's track and other non-contact sports for women as more appropriate than women studying self-defense. Um, so as part of the backlash, but also as part of a concern for women's health and fitness, uh, so many women by the 1930s and 40s were being steered out of self-defense and into more acceptable sports for women. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if any of that came up in the earlier period in the sources you consulted. Yeah, and prior to this time period that I'm looking at, so in the 1880s and 1890s when women started to really um, become more involved in athletics, there was this concern that it was um, too masculine, that it was going to impair their ability to have children. Um, in fact, Dr. Edward Clark wrote this whole essay about, or book about how it was dangerous for women to study, to go to school, and especially athletics. Um, women physicians started to fight back against that. That's why a lot of the women's colleges started to include physical fitness classes, and the training of women in all different types of sports became more common and popular in part because of women's colleges. But what they found is that 
after this period, after this wave of feminism and the emphasis on the right to vote and everything, in the 30s and the 40s, there was a backlash, not only against, like you're talking about, not only against athletics, but against women going to college again. And women's colleges actually ended up having to go co-ed in order to survive because people were pulling their young women out of school, saying it's not preparing them for married life, they're becoming too independent, many of them were choosing careers instead of a family. And so we see a backlash against it in the 30s and the 40s. So this period I'm talking about is a really short time period between kind of 1890 and 1920, and it parallels this uh, feminism of the suffrage era. Yeah. And I'd like to study the self-defense from this time period uh, that you're talking about, the 40s and 50s, because what I notice is there's still women training in self-defense in the 40s and 50s, but look how sexualized this imagery starts to be. This is the, like the late 20s. And, all, and notice the 20s and 30s, they're, they're, they're seen as a lot more sexual or feminized um, versions, uh, a lot of makeup and a lot of like, look at me, I'm so pretty. Um, so I think that that's what's ha going to be happening in the 30s and 40s, but I haven't really dived in to, to look at what changes, because they can't make it go away entirely. Women are still studying self-defense. And you know that, that basketball becomes very popular. Um, yes. An appropriate form of exercise. And the only reason you really need to exercise is to prepare your body for motherhood, is the concept. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yes, thank you for... It's fine. Um, thank you for speaking. And um, I had a question, um, if you know about Bay Area um, pr programs. I know that like maybe 10 years ago, I took a class here on campus that um, was given by the police department um, here on campus. I think the program was rape and now it's rad. Um, do you know of it? And are there any other like meetup groups? And the other thing I also had a question on was um, why Chicago? Why did you um, uh, focus on finding murders in that city? Was it because of women were politi political there or there was more activity um, with jujitsu or um, if just the newspapers wrote more about it? Sure, the Chicago focus was because of the newspaper articles were highlighting all the cases of murder um, and violence against women, but they were also highlighting the masher problem at the same time. And they were kind of conflating the, the issues with uh, violence. So I wanted to look at that case, uh, that city specifically, to try to figure out what was causing all of this uh, rash violence against women. Was it really the shadowy stranger on the street, as they were suggesting, or was it the violence in the home? So that's what made me call attention to that. As far as different self-defense classes, yeah, I have lots of opinions. <laughs> um, any self-defense class is good in the sense that you're learning something, which you didn't have before you went in, but there are very good self-defense classes that are more focused on this idea of gender socialization and understanding the roots of violence against women. And those classes, unfortunately, the best ones are in the East Bay, in Oakland, and I can give you a list of, of instructors there that are trained in feminist empowerment self-defense. Um, but there, but a lot of the police-focused self-defense courses uh, actually harken back to this earlier time period, and they suggest, you know, women's place is not really on the street. There's a lot of warnings about, about maintaining your safety and security mostly by avoiding going out. <laughs> and so, uh, and that has a lot of um, connotations from this earlier period that said that a woman's place was in the home. So I don't always uh, like the focus of some of those self-defense uh, classes. So yeah, we can talk afterwards. I'll give you a, a list of great instructors. So Wendy, thank you very much. That was such an interesting talk. You had mentioned early in the talk about the um, self-defense being focused on, or only white, sort of white, upper middle class women being able to afford it. Can you talk a little bit about where we are today in terms of race and ethnicity and economic, socioeconomic status and, and being a, this being available to them? Yeah, it's still a major issue. Um, most of the self-defense classes now tend to be through, women, young women tend to be exposed to that through um, college. So it's still, it parallels mostly middle and upper class white women who have access to college education. Um, and that is a big concern and self-defense advocates want to bring self-defense into the high schools so that it's accessible to all women, young women, and young men growing up. Um, in line with that, since uh, 2016, with the rise in, of hate crimes, 
a lot of self-defense instructors come up to me and tell me that they're seeing a whole new population of people coming into their self-defense classes. So most self-defense classes now are not women's self-defense classes necessarily. Um, and they're changing the name and changing their marketing of it um, because they have a lot of people coming in, diverse genders, sexualities, and um, from different parts of society that want self-defense training because they're feeling more threatened in this atmosphere. So they're actually seeing a rise, and they're, they're not happy about the reasons why people are coming in, obviously, but self-defense is seeing another wave. Hi. Yeah, I had actually a couple of suggestions and then a criticism, okay. if you don't mind. Um, one is, you know Alice Guy Blaché, the director? So <clears throat> she's an early film director, um, started in France, came to the States. She wrote a, um, a produced a movie called uh, Making of American Citizen in 1912, which really goes to a lot of what you're saying. It's really focused on domestic violence of foreign, I suppose to be Russian immigrant. He beats his wife constantly, and he comes to the U.S. <clears throat> where it's not permitted. And it's it, the woman is not really empowered in the film, except at one point where a guy comes along and sees him beating her with a stick and takes the stick away and shows her how to beat him. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's meant more as kind of a comic scene. Right, right. But um, it is very interesting. She also did a movie, by the way, of, about a, an all-woman society. Um, I, I think she did that while she was mm. in France. Um, the other thing is, is, so I think her work is really interesting. But um, the other thing is about the connection, especially when you talk about Roosevelt and the sort of manliness movement, the rise of the cadet movement, which starts in your period, the 1880s, 1890s, at schools. And here, you know, there was a women's parallel. So when the Pershing Rifle starts and schools start developing cadet corps, uh, women's schools also have cadet corps. We had a cadet corps. Mm -hmm. So at Santa's, in the normal school, there were two companies of the cadet corps. One was all men, one was all women. So around, the, I, I found this in the archives. So around the turn of the century, there was an all women um, cadet corps, and you, so you might look into that military training, paramilitary training, as kind of a parallel. So the other thing is a kind of critique. When you talk about uh, immigrants and women of color, which today <clears throat> is often seen as synonymous, if you're talking about 1880s, 1890s, to really before World War I, really even into the 20s, in these northern cities like Chicago or St. Louis or New York or out here in California, what we think of people of color, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, or Mexican Americans, very small, almost minuscule part of the urban population. Mm -hmm. And um, so when, I think you're right about the focus being on what we would say white middle class, but it really was Christian. I mean, it was really wasps, and it, it was really the idea of white Protestant middle class women. And the other was not so much people of color, it was Southern Europeans, Catholics, Jews, uh, Irish, uh, who were the urban underclass. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, the point is there, the groups are different. So when you say immigrants are people of color, it, it's not synonymous in your period as it is or nearly is today. That exactly. would just be Yeah, my no, point. exactly. And, and in fact, um, when I say that, uh, men of color and immigrant men were often portrayed as the shadowy stranger. I'm talking mostly about Italian men yeah. that were portrayed as this dangerous stranger, and Asian men uh, at the time, depending yeah, on if also, it was in the West uh, or Eastern European. I mean, Eastern the, European. the, the mm -hmm. villain in this movie is clearly a Russian. It's not clear if it's a Jew or Christian, but he's clearly an Eastern European. And so I think there were all of these classes of immigrants that were seen as, and the the movie is really about socializing people to be American. It's really interesting because Glee Bache was quite radical, but her view of America is very um, kind of, uh, that Americanism protects women, that, that women in America cannot be beaten or abused in this way that they can in Europe. So uh, it doesn't reflect reality necessarily, but it is an interesting view. Yeah, that is really interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions? comments. Okay. Thank you.